Thank you very much. I want to thank the uh, Kellogg School of Management and the Aspen Institute for uh, having this conference. I want to especially thank Dean Blount for not only the introduction, but uh, the very stimulating conversation before about what's happening in higher education and your interesting comments that you just made. I, uh, it's a privilege to, to listen to you. Um, I'm not an expert, obviously, on, on corporations and, and corporate government, governance. But uh, I'm hoping I can contribute in some way to this conference by giving a perspective on that from the political uh, viewpoint, uh, where the interface, has, as the dean just suggested, has increased rather than declined. The, the topic of the conference, rethinking shareholder value and the purpose of the firm, uh, is something that is more, I assume, in the wheelhouse of many of the other speakers. But I'm thinking that uh, what I'm going to talk about is something that is concerning uh, just about anybody in the business world, in the corporate world. A part of the topic, if I had the time, would relate to lobbying and the role that lobbying plays, uh, issues having to do just with whether to lobby, how to lobby, and also the, the sort of darker side of it, the, the fundraising side of lobbying and the gifts and, and, and the impact that has on the electoral process. And if we have time for questions, I could speak about that. But I'm going to uh, spend most of my time about the direct relationship that now exists between uh, the corporate form and our election process. Uh, and that, of course, is an outgrowth in a very significant way of a decision just a couple of years ago by the United States Supreme Court uh, in the case known as Citizens United. As the dean said, uh, I created a group, uh, founded a group called Progressives United as a response uh, to that decision. Some of my Republican friends have said, isn't progressive a Democrat word? No, it's not. In Wisconsin, the Progressive Party came out of the Republican Party. Progressive in Wisconsin means good government and accountability. So when I talk about Progressives United, that's what we mean. By the way, we're a 501c4, but we, I think we're the only one in the country that limits how much money we take and disclose every dime. Because we think that you can run an organization or a business like that without having to take unlimited, undisclosed contributions. Now, this is not a topic that always excites people. And so I was slightly surprised to get a, a call from Variety magazine. They wanted to interview me. That's not a publication that called me very often <laughs> through my career. They wanted to know what I thought about the job that Stephen Colbert was doing and trying to highlight the problem with the Citizens United decision by creating his own super PAC. And I said, well, you know, I, I've been all around the country trying to explain this to people and get people motivated. I don't know, I give Stephen Colbert credit for, for helping. I told the Variety Magazine a reporter that I was funnier than Stephen Colbert, but I did think he was doing a pretty good job. And of course, they didn't quote me on that. That was the only uh, good line I had in the whole thing. Uh, but the fact is, Colbert did a brilliant job of showing that, that what happened in Citizens United was not just another un a sort of tawdry chapter in the history of campaign finance reform. It is a huge difference, uh, not of degree, but of kind. Now, in this country, we've had a long tradition of not allowing corporations to use their treasuries to participate in electioneering. It's well over 100 years old. I mean, I just remember as a kid, just sort of anecdotally, that. My dad always talked about politics, and I remember in the various political campaigns, local or otherwise, that people might have signs, car tops in those days. Remember the car tops? Maybe you don't, but people used to have car tops for candidates. Yard signs. Businesses wouldn't do that in my hometown of Janesville, Wisconsin. You didn't want to tick off 50% or even 25% of the customers. You wouldn't think of it. My dad was a member of the Rotary Club. 130 people, very nice people, but he was one of only two Democrats. But in that room, it was always good humor. He would, they let him be president, and, and one guy, his best friend, would yell, tell that Galdarn Democrat to sit down every time he'd preside. But there was an understanding of a distinction between politics and business, which is something that basically I grew up with. Maybe it's naive in this world. But the fact is that this is something that has a real history in the law of our country. The law that prohibited corporations from using their treasuries for electioneering was signed in 1907 and followed 
uh, several decades of populist concern about what were called the robber barons. Uh, when you refer to robber barons at Stanford University where I'm teaching, it's a little edgy. Because <laughs> you're on the farm of a robber baron who made that possible. But we know that that's what drove a lot of this in Wisconsin. The progressive movement was a response to the timber men and the railroad men. There was a feeling that this country's democracy was being constricted and controlled by the growing power of certain interests, particularly, uh, obviously, in the oil industry. And so among the progressive and populist reforms, you know, it was the Sherman Antitrust Act, the, the, the harbinger of the beginning of the Food and Drug Administration after revelations of what was happening here in this city uh, in terms of, of food. The direct election of United States senators was created by the 17th Amendment. And yes, in 1907, a Republican president, Theodore Roosevelt, signed the Tillman Act. The Tillman Act, which was good law until about three years ago, says corporations cannot use their treasuries, the money that we pay to buy something, for electioneering, for campaigns. Justice Stevens, another Republican from Chicago, wrote the dissent in the Citizens United case and said the following in criticism of the court's decision. At bottom, the court's opinion is thus a rejection of the common sense of the American people, who have recognized a need to prevent corporations from undermining self-government since the founding, and who fought against the distinctive corrupting potential of corporate electioneering since the days of Theodore Roosevelt. So that is the law, and the rationale for the law that was struck down in Citizens United. Now, as the decades went on, people noticed the rising power of unions. And those who were concerned about the power of unions and their use of their treasury said, wait a minute, they shouldn't be able to do it either. And so, among the many provisions of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, one was the, the equivalent, which said that unions could not use their treasuries directly on political electioneering. And that also was overturned by the Citizens United decision of three years ago. Several decades passed, and then Watergate occurred. Next week, I'm going to give the 40th anniversary keynote of, of Watergate before Common Cause in Washington. And their focus is, we know a lot about Watergate, all the intrigues and the interesting things that happened. And many of us watched it in college as we uh, were fascinated by this thing unfolding. But what people forget, it was also a major campaign finance scandal that included bags full of money from corporate treasuries being brought to Creep, the lovely named uh, committee to re-elect uh, President Nixon. <laughs> Out of that uh, development came many things, and one of them was the, the, the major uh, federal elections campaign law that was created in the early 70s. That law, uh, for the first time, created political action committees. And, and now people finally realize political action committees, the regular ones, are really not a big deal. The most they can give to people are 10,000 bucks. The money has to be raised independently. A corporation has to raise it from their employees. They can't just take it out of the treasury. The unions have to raise the money independently from union members on a voluntary basis. Uh, and that, it was supposed to be a reform, uh, although some people saw it as, as an evil. Uh, at this point, I think people realize by comparison it was pretty minor compared to what's happening now. But one of the problems as time went on is that a huge loophole was developed in the federal elections law. There was an allowance within the law for the use of soft money, unlimited contributions by corporations and unions, for purposes of getting out the vote uh, and other narrow purposes. The problem came, sadly, from my point of view, with the Clinton administration. Bill Clinton and Al Gore talked to their lawyers and decided, you know what, we think we can run television ads with this money as long as we don't say vote for or vote against somebody. This opened up a huge loophole which came to be known as soft money. The McCain-Feingold bill that I spent many years trying to pass with John McCain and finally succeeded was a bill that principally banned those contributions to the political parties. And it's still the law. People say to me, well, what, how do you feel about your law being overturned? Well, it's kind of like this. We saw this brick wall that had been built up for 100 years, and we noticed that one of the bricks had a hole in it. It needed to be replaced, so we replaced the brick. 
Then the Supreme Court came along and took a mallet and knocked down the entire wall and our brick is still fine. <laughs> that wasn't the plan. Because a huge loophole that dwarfs our concern has been opened up. What was soft money? Soft money was a system where corporations and unions were giving money directly to the political parties and it was being directly solicited by members of Congress, including conversations on the floor of the Senate that I heard. I heard one senator from Louisiana say to a Republican senator, hey, this company gave us $100,000 for our dinner for Tuesday night. And he said, hey, they gave us $100,000 for ours too. This same Louisiana senator got a little tired of my rabble rousing about campaign finance and also wanting to ban gifts for members of Congress, and he's bigger than I am. He came over to me and said, uh, Russ, sounds like you all up in Wisconsin don't have as much fun as we do in Louisiana. And I said, well, it's probably true. But I still think, I still think that we need to do something about this. So we, we passed McCain-Feingold, and it was approved by the Supreme Court in 2003. And people forget this. But the elections in 2004 and 2006 and 2008 did not look the same as the elections in 2010 and 2012. You couldn't do these unlimited contributions. There were 527 groups that were running independent ads, but the FEC cracked down on that and fined them heavily. What happened? Increasingly, particularly with the Obama election in 2008, people turned to the internet. Small contributions small dollar contributions and a very much more democratic form of fundraising was taking hold. The fact is, we had put the genie back in the bottle. Now the system is always one that can be exploited. There always can be loopholes. But the fact is, this wasn't a loophole. This was an aggressive act by the United States Supreme Court, driven by interests that wanted this done, to completely destroy the efforts that we had made to bring this system under some kind of reasonable control. This is what, by a five to four vote, the United States Supreme Court did, basically out of the blue. John McCain and I were sitting together in the Supreme Court watching this, and we looked at each other, and we went, my God, it sounds like they're going to do this whole thing. And you understand, there was absolutely no reason under the facts of the case to do this at all. Citizens United was about whether a movie on DirecTV about Hillary Clinton was covered by McCain-Feingold, whether we would prohibit it. Well, I wrote it. No. You know, that was not the intent. The court had all kinds of things it could have done to give them what they're supposed to do, unless you believe in activist Supreme Courts, to give a narrow ruling and say, actually, this isn't covered. They took the occasion to completely uh, change the system in a way that, that makes activist uh, Supreme Court decisions, making this one of the most activist, I think, frankly, legally inappropriate decisions of all time. And many law professors uh, who I have consulted with from coast to coast agree that from a legal point of view, this was a frightful decision. If you want to read a wonderful discussion of this, look at Judge Justice Stevens' dissent, where he talks about what corporations were intended to be by the founders. And you know, he was 90 years old. It was his last day in the court, and he made the other justices listen for 20 minutes while he sort of let them have it about, about this decision. And it's pretty ironic to read a Justi Judge, uh, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in this case and how he talks about corporations when just a few weeks after, in a case uh, relating to AT&T, where AT&T was asserting a right to privacy, this same justice who said that corporations have a constitutional right to speak mocked AT&T's claim that they had a right to privacy. He made fun of it. Well, if a corporation has a, is a person, in this sense, and has a right to speak, why can't they vote? One guy in Maryland was, owns a McDonald's. He was going to run his McDonald's as a candidate. The other day, a guy got arrested or pulled over because he was in the HOV lane. Nobody else was in the car. He had corporate papers next to him. He said, I'm with another person. But this sort of points out the absurdity of of this approach from the point of view of, of, of the way in which corporations have been understood throughout our country's history. I mean, people forget corporations are created by statute through law. It's not in the Constitution. I mean, I think in theory you could just not have corporations at all. I'm not recommending that. But it's not as if they are legal persons in the sense that they couldn't simply be eliminated by statute. I believe, I'll have to check with other law professors on this, but 
whether or not uh, they could, that could be done constitutionally. I, I think it could. But that's not my point. I'm not here to talk about eliminating getting rid of corporations. I value corporations. I understand the importance of the notion of limited liability. I think it's fine when corporations run advertisements trying to make a point outside of elections. I, I, I think it's on a little too often, but the BP ad that tells me that the Gulf's being cleaned up, I'm glad to hear it. That's, I think, a perfectly appropriate, important thing that corporations should do, especially when they run into a problem. In fact, I had a, another encounter involving Stephen Colbert on this. He asked me to come on his show. Not always a smart move. But <laughs> I was in Milwaukee, and he, he sort of, you know, from satellite, and he gets on, and he sort of reassures you in advance. He says, now listen, this is going to be fun. He said, I'm, I'm an idiot. You know, I'm playing a role. I'm an idiot, and you're supposed to correct me. And I thought, well, that sounds fine. You know, so he gets on, and he goes, tonight we have recently deposed United States Senator Russ Feingold, like I was Hosni Mubarak. Puts me on the defensive, and after I answered a couple of questions, he said, what is your problem? What have you got against corporations? He said, if you see a corporation walking down the street, do you cross the street? <laughs> he said, do you, would you let your daughters date a corporation? <laughs> so obviously, I laughed, and I didn't know what to say. But I, I, I just said, well, of course not. That's not what this is about at all. This is about the fact that for the first time in 105 years, when you buy toothpaste or buy a gallon of gas, that money can immediately be used against your candidate or for a candidate you don't believe in. That is the sea change that Citizens United represents. And one of the ironies of this is that this really isn't only about, well, I wonder which party won the election. In other words, people look at this in a, in a paradigm or through a prism of, well, who won or who lost under this system? I would suggest that's not the only or most important question. Some 1.47 billion new dollars were spent by outside groups in the election. And one of the problems I'm having on this issue is the Democrats are saying, hey, look, maybe this was pretty good for us. We won. We had a huge victory. I know for a fact because when we do fundraising for Progressives United, we specifically meet with people who have given millions of dollars and say, look, we're trying to change this system. And they told me that there are already briefing sessions going on in Washington where the Democrat consultants are saying, this, this is a good deal for Democrats. And this is exactly what they did in soft money. I heard both sides, a good deal for Republicans, good deal for Democrats. That's the pitch uh, in trying to preserve this new system. And I thought it was pretty disturbing, frankly, as a co-chair of the president's re-election campaign and a big supporter of his, to see him give the State of the Union and lay out many, many things. This very president who called out the Supreme Court in person for having uh, done the Citizens United decision, unprecedented thing, he did not even mention the issue of money and politics. It is, in effect, a conspiracy of silence as both sides continue down this road. Little piece of good news today, because we've, our group's been railing about the president's OFA group saying they were going to take uh, corporate contributions, and for $500,000, you get to meet with the president four times a year. I understand that as of today, they've withdrawn that. And that was after brutal editorials in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, where I know the president read them and, and probably thought he really doesn't want to go down this road. So I'm not saying there isn't some sensitivity to it, but there's enormous pressure from the political class, not from the corporations, from the political class to keep this huge money machine going. Now let me elaborate on why I think this isn't just about who won. For those on the Democratic side who think this was a good deal, you're not going to have Barack Obama as your candidate every time. In fact, you never will again. These kind of candidates don't come along very often. He was in an exceptional position as an historic president running for re-election and to rely on that as a believing that it was because of, the, of these kind of contributions that the Democrats won is absurd. It's also sad the way I think it depressed a lot of young people and others who had become motivated by the political system in 2008. They really felt invited to the table of American politics. And there was a different mood this time as these enormous 
uh, uh, contributions and political ads dominated the process in a way that looked very different. And many conversations with young people and others, they felt that it was a very different kind of environment where they did not feel part of the game. So that's one problem. But there are deeper problems. Uh, the problem of this is we talk about you know, where the money came from and what candidates got it or what benefited from it, but where did the money go? Who's getting the money? I mean, this is an enormous amount of money that wasn't being spent in this way before. Who's it going to? Well, you can, certainly television stations aren't crying. But it's not just them. It's consultants. Washington and other consultants who take huge amounts of money telling people that they can sort of take this money and turn it into political victories. If you need an example, just look up uh, Karl Rove's performance, dissembling performance on Fox News the night of the election. Still spinning that Romney was going to win uh, as he raked in the cash from this system that is an enormous, I think, economically inefficient and useless uh, use of our dollars in this country. So why isn't there conversation about where the money's going and who's getting it? It's a very serious part of the discussion. But there's an even more serious one, and the one I want to most talk to you about. I don't just look at this, I don't look at this as big, mean corporations coming in trying to swallow up the political process. I actually see corporations and wealthy people as victims of this process. I see them as the fall guys of American politics. If there are no limits and no disclosure, you are vulnerable to anything. When I tried to pass McCain-Feingold, the CED, Committee for Economic Development, leading corporate executives came to me and John McCain and said, we'd like to help you. And they did. Gave us a lot of credibility to have people in corporate America on our side. But one of the gentlemen came up to me and put his arm around me and said, Russ, you're always calling it legalized bribery. It's extortion. And of course, he was right. It's not like corporate CEOs are sitting at their desk and see this big pile of money and go, you know, I'm going to call up Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell and get rid of some of this. The call comes the other way. The call is friendly, but the call is, has a message in it. And that message is, you better pony up without even having to say it. Is that where we want our corporations to do? Is that what we want our business leaders to be doing and to be involved in? Well, they're involved in it, and you know, I got balled out in a pretty positive way. I thought he was nice about it, but Fred Smith, the genius who came up with the idea of FedEx, heard me railing up against his company when they were giving those contributions uh, to compete with UPS in the mid-90s, and he, he came, he said, I'd, li I'd like to meet with Senator Feingold. So, Obviously, I was thrilled to meet with him, and he was very, very gentle in the way he said it, but he said, Russ, I didn't create this system. You created a system where if I don't give 200,000 bucks to the Democratic dinner and UPS does, I am not living up to my responsibility to my corporation, to my shareholders, and to my board of directors to uh, do what I can to protect their interests. It's legal. And of course, he's right. He didn't create it. And there's really nothing morally wrong. In fact, it might be legally wrong for him not to do it. That's the bind that we're putting corporate America in. Interesting law review article that was handed to me at, at Connecticut Law School, the Chapman Law Review uh, article about how Watergate had an impact in all this. And the author uh, commented that thoughtful money and politic reforms like accurate Disclosure and public financing are also needed to complement security law reforms because the issue of corruption has not gone away. During the McConnell litigation, that's the case that affirmed McCain-Feingold, before the Supreme Court, an ex-CEO declared under oath as follows. When sitting members solicit large corporate and union contributions, the leaders of these organizations feel intense pressure to contribute because experience has taught that the consequences of failing to contribute or failing to contribute enough may be very negative. Business and labor leaders believe, based on their experience, that disappointed members and their party colleagues may shun or disfavor them because they have not contributed. So my view is that a better way to look at this is to think in terms of how corporations are being put in a vulnerable position that is not appropriate in our system of government. 
Let me take it to one more level of concern. Again, this isn't about who won. What's going on in these conversations when people are asked for this kind of money? In the Midwest, probably everywhere, they say there's no such thing as a free lunch. I would submit there's no such thing as a free $10 million contribution either. <laughs> Off the record conversations involving unlimited, undisclosed money. This is a tainted enterprise, hinged only on technical legality. When I think about the amount of corp corporations spend on PR and trying to handle difficult situations, it doesn't really matter whether it's legal or illegal sometimes. If you're tainted, you're tainted. And I would say anybody who's participating in this right now is taking an enormous risk for your company. Because at some point, this is going to collapse. I remember the Congress in 1990, they all got involved in that bank kiting thing, that check kiting thing. And, and I, I don't know if it was illegal, but it just looked so darn bad that the very distinguished members of Congress, some of the best, just plain lost their jobs because it, it didn't smell right. That's what's going on with the way in which people are being pressured to give these contributions. Seeking and giving unlimited contributions in this way, in my view, is being engaged in a corrupt enterprise that can't be sustained. Best advice I'd give to any corporation about this right now is stay away. Don't do it. John McCain says, once John's got a line, his wife used to say, I love John's jokes. It's just very exciting though when he gets a new one. Um, he, but John is a really good messenger, or messenger, because he will get a line he keeps using. The one he says, let me tell you, there will be a scandal. There will be a scandal. Of course, there always was. Watergate, we got the Watergate reforms because of a scandal. Uh, the scandals uh, uh, at the time of the turn of the, of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, the lobbying bill that Senator, then Senator Obama and I passed was because of the Abramoff scandal. Well, my point is, I take it one step higher than, uh, further than John. It isn't there will be a scandal. There is a scandal going on right now. Those phone calls are being made as we speak and as we sit here. It's just that we don't have the reporters right now at the newspapers and others who could win a Pulitzer Prize to uncover it. I had a chance to meet with Sheryl Sandberg, Facebook, a thrill, and I, you know, I didn't have any particular agenda. I just said, have you gotten any of these calls yet? This is before Obama I had changed his mind about these contributions. And she said, not yet. I said, well, I'm going to check in with you later. And I want to know what's being said. I want to know if these conversations have a transactional quality. So it seems to me that this is something anybody who's concerned about their business should consider before going down this road. If power corrupts and power, absolute power corrupts absolutely, I would suggest that unlimited money also has the capacity to corrupt absolutely, and you want to stay away from it. But finally, even maybe more profound than all of this, all of these things I've talked about that are not about who wins or win, who loses, is what happens after the election in our government? If both sides are constantly asking for huge contributions from the same interests, you know, Democrats were calling Exxon and BP and so on, what happens is that Certain interests are basically insulated from the political process and will not be affected. Now, this is what we saw with soft money. Soft money was so tempting, led by the Democrats, that both parties took so much money from certain interests that certain pieces of legislation were passed, not 5149 or 5545. Those aren't the ones to look at. It's the ones that are 90 to 10 or 85 to 15. Now, it might be because they were great ideas, and only idiots like me voted no. But I can tell the beholding quality of that amount of money led to certain outcomes. Many of you will disagree with me on this, but I opposed a number of the trade agreements of the 1990s because I thought they were heavily balanced against the workers in this country. The vote on the China deal was 83 to 15. Whether it's right or not, pretty weird vote when you consider the Democrats were, were you know, there were quite a few Democrats who usually didn't want to go against labor. It wasn't because they didn't like, they didn't want labor, it wasn't because they thought it would be great if labor were mad at them. It's that they had taken huge amounts of money to make sure it went through, whether it's a good idea or not. Another great example, the vote on the Telecom Act of 1996 was 91 to 5. 
This is a bill that, as far as I'm concerned, really limited diversity of voices in this country, particularly in radio. Purchased, in my view, having seen it on the floor of the Senate, largely by these unlimited soft money contributions. But Exhibit A has to be a vote of 90 to 8. The repeal of Glass-Steagall, 90 to 8. It, the, the aggressiveness of the Democratic side in raising money from Wall Street throughout this period that continues today, the need for this infusion of soft money is the reason it was 90 to 8. It's not like members of Congress really understood this stuff. We all know they didn't. That's how it happened. And that's, when it gonna, that's what's going to continue to happen if we allow this kind of unlimited fundraising, undisclosed fundraising, to have a hammerlock on our democracy. Finally, let me talk about three ways in which this can be counteracted, three different approaches, briefly. I want to give you a positive, from my point of view, take on this. This isn't going to continue. This system can't continue. It will fall of its own weight, whether by scandal or resistance, I hope, from people in the business community who don't believe they should be asked to play this game. One of the ways in which change may come may come from pressure to change the corporate, corporate governance. It's an article by uh, Greenfield, the stakeholder strategy by Kent Greenfield in the Democracy Journal. Changing corporations, not the Constitution, is a key to fairer post-Citizens United world. He takes the view that you would, many of you are much more knowledgeable than I about, about changing the way in which corporations are uh, constituted in terms of who serves on boards and who they represent and whether they represent all the employees or the broader community. He takes the view that, yes, we can call corporations persons, but they must live up to their personhood through change in corporate law. He criticizes the fact that corporate law has been delegated to the states and suggests that it should be a national corporate law of this kind. This is an area that I've not spent a lot of time on, it's something you would have much more experience with. But I can tell you, I know enough, having been in politics for a while, that when basically every new legislator in 50 states has got to put in a bill on the same subject, once it was a green bill, you know, sometimes it's a, a, you know, a bill to counteract terrorism or whatever, right now, it's very cool to have a bill about campaign finance and very cool to have a bill about change, about putting rules in terms of corporate governance. So that's one thing to be aware of. I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm not saying I'm against any of the changes. But that is one route that corporations will have to face and think about if this problem continues. A second is, is the reason that I sometimes when I give a variation on this speech, I entitle it Democrat and Republican Toothpaste. People just look at me as you're looking at me like, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is that if this is going to be the deal, that we're going to have corporations use their treasuries in political campaigns, a guy like me wants to buy his toothpaste from a Democrat company. Democrat toothpaste company, not a Republican one. Is this good for the economy? We have uh, recently on Fox News, there was a Announcement that miracle Grow had decided to give a lot of money uh, to the conservative side in the election. And somebody said, aren't you concerned about what this means in terms of your customer base? And they said, no, our most loyal customers are conservative. I tell you, there's a lot of Democrats that buy that stuff in Wisconsin. And, and there's even a guy that came on Fox News and was interviewed. He created a conservative barbecue sauce because he got sick and tired of spending money on liberal barbecue. We even had this in Wisconsin on the left. You may have heard we had a little trouble politically the last couple of years. You know, Chicago used to make fun of us for our tame politics. We made up for that in the last couple of years. Well, the governor uh, jammed through a, what was to me an outrageous bill on collective bargaining and created great anger both in terms of the style and the substance. Uh, but we have a tradition in Wisconsin of Memorial Day weekend. We have the biggest bratwurst festival in the world, okay? The biggest, the most bratwurst served anywhere at one weekend. And it was done at a, at a facility in Madison and donated by Johnsonville Brats, which are good brats. But they're big supporters of Governor Walker. So that, two years ago, 
there were four alternative bratwurst festivals. <laughs> Which, you know, is a funny example of it. But, you know, to me, this goes back to my original comment about growing up in Janesville, Wisconsin. The idea that you're really going to evaluate what you buy based on the politics of the owners or the company, sometimes good, a lot of times, I don't think it's a terribly good way to run an economy. I mean, we may have to even you know, do, have Republican and Democrat cheese heads in Wisconsin, and we really, we can't have that. So, so that's the second. I mean, I'm not using the word boycott, because I certainly don't think we're going to be, I'm going to be advocating boycotts, but what we're basically talking about is that kind of customer uh, or consumer voting, if you will, that will be a very significant factor if we continue down this road. So the last alternative is the one I'm, of course, most comfortable with, which is government. Yes, big government cleaning itself up. Government has a responsibility, because it's been given a sacred trust by the people, to fix the democracy and to make the democracy work. And so in the end, I think that's the best route to go. And I think that the most effective way to make this happen is to overturn Citizens United. People may say, well, how are you going to do that? Well, it was a five to four vote. President Obama got reelected. People say, well, the guys that voted for it are better health than the people that voted against it. Well, that's up to higher authorities. And we saw that, you know, even the Pope resigned. So <laughs> maybe, maybe one of these guys will quit. It's really as simple as that. The decision could be overturned. And I frankly would say any, any good lawyer who looks fairly at this decision will simply say that was a rotten decision and it would be overturned. Not to mention the fact that no one can seriously deny the corrupting aspect of these contributions. The majority opinion was based on the idea that they were independent even though we know that the very people that are sent to run these organizations are the former chief of staff and operatives of the politician. They don't need, you don't even have to wink at them. I know exactly who I would put over there if I wanted to have a super PAC. I wouldn't have to say a word. It's all taken care of. Worked together for 20 years, not independent. And so this thing, I think, can be overturned. And the question is whether it's overturned in two years, four years, 10 years how long it takes. In the meantime, there are movements out there to have a constitutional amendment that would either change the First Amendment and free speech issue or to go after the notion of corporate personhood under the 14th Amendment. My view is constitutional amendment is not the way to go. I respect the people that are activists on this. I, for one, like it that we've never amended the Bill of Rights in over 200 years, and I don't want to start now, even for my cause. And by the way, it's not going to work. It's not going to pass. So what can we do in the interim? Disclosure laws. There is, I helped author the disclosure bill after Citizens United, and if you look at the majority opinion in Citizens United, the majority, Antonin Scalia is passionate in saying, of course, if we're going to do this, you have to have disclosure. And when McCain and I used to go to the floor, they'd say, Russ and John, why do you need this? We just need disclosure. Sun, sunlight is the best disinfectant. As soon as the decision came down, Mitch McConnell and all the Republicans said, oh, no, no, we can't have that. So even the court was basically saying this doesn't work with disclosure. Fortunately, Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski, who had a kind of rough time getting her reelection last time, has joined with Ron Wyden on the Democratic side to propose exactly that. In California, the California Disclose Act is only two votes short of passing, and I think will become the law in the wealthiest and biggest state. So I think the information about what's happening with this will come to the fore. And that's exactly what happened to the Target Corporation, Minnesota, when they, uh, they have a disclosure law there. They gave 150000 to an anti-gay uh, group that was promoting a Republican candidate. And, and one of their key people, Lady Gaga, got mad at them. And she let them have it. And they decided they had to, to pull back. Uh, so that, that can work as well. Public financing. We had a good public financing system for presidential campaigns it can be fixed. It needs to be updated. There has never been public financing of congressional and Senate races. The Federal Election Commission is a complete joke. They are completely uh, deadlocked because they have the same number of Democrat and Republicans, and we need a new enforcement agency to make this all work. We can easily pass a statute that says that this 
fake independence doesn't work and narrow that definition to make those sort of phony sending of your chief of staff over there be limited. And uh, finally, I believe that in the context of all these changes that can help as we try to overturn Citizens United, it is possible to raise substantial funds under a system where people use the internet and other means that do not involve the kinds of transactional conversations that are coming to dominate our political process. So as we have our media and many of our conversations dominated by the great fears of our time, you know, the fiscal cliff, the debt ceiling, sequestration, I'm not saying they aren't of significance, but the fact that this isn't being discussed at all as corporations are being manipulated and exploited to finance this system is a sign of trouble with our system. You know, 40 years ago, probably the, one of the most famous quotations of the Watergate era was, there is a cancer on the White House. I submit that there is a cancer on both our political system and our economy because of this development. And I look forward to the results of your conference to see how you think we should fix it. Thanks for having me.